Now what we've done is we've modularized our education system so we have different paths that people can specialize in. Um, instead of taking a, having to commit to a full five-day level two, for example, which was really your only option a few years ago, up until four years ago, now you can take a two-day, what we call a level two training program, then you can take an assessed training program, which is also two days, and then we have credit options as well. And those are some of the things that I can answer to later on if you have specific questions. But it just allows people to commit two days instead of five. <laughs> and we have a lot of part-time members. We have a lot of people who are professionals in other industries, and they teach on, on weekends, as I'm sure the PSIA does. Um, so that was that was good for them, and that's the road we've gone down. And now we've, we've succeeded in modularizing all the way up through to the level four. Uh, which is our top certification. Um, that communication of a consistent message is so is, is important, um, and uh, we just want to avoid stuff like this. <laughs> Maybe in our best intentions, sometimes. <laughs> um, let's get to that the hill tomorrow. <laughs> That's our that's our gonna be our phrase of the year at home for sure. It's gonna pop up more than it should, I know. Um, to make sure that we, we stay consistent, um, we have uh, come up with uh, what we call our core. And this isn't an entirely accurate image because I think we, we know that this thing's probably running this way. Um, but I couldn't find any sort of uplifting images of tornadoes that go up. So, um, so we, we picked this one. But the, the, the message here is that our technical reference, our decision-making process, and our, and our reflective learning philosophy, which, which is sort of the overlying um, philosophy that we use in, in teaching, those are our core concepts. And um, this is, it's, it's a, referred to as scaffolding. We have our core concepts, and those remain the same all the way up through all of our levels. As you go through those levels, you gain more knowledge, you find more tools, you have more experience, you, you know, and, and you just pick up more things as you go, but everything you're doing is based on these three main things down here. And I'm going to dig into those three a little bit for you tonight before we head out and just explain what some of those are. My group will have heard some of these things on the hill today. Maybe not all of them because they weren't all relevant in today's group. Right, I didn't, I didn't go through all of our technical reference points because they, some of them just weren't applicable to the group that I had today. And that falls into our decision-making process. So young instructors, we want to help them learn how to make decisions. So not give them a step-by-step -step lesson process that, that has them in a format every time they do a lesson, but rather um, give them some tools to help them look at, at their lesson, look at their, their students, look at the terrain that they have, all of that kind of stuff, how much time they have, and, and make decisions based on that. We used to have what we called six-step lesson planning. I can't even remember what all the six steps are, um, one after the other at this point. But that doesn't matter because this is what we're, we're doing now. And uh, the first, the biggest one in the middle is called, what's called our learning contract. And the learning contract is, is building a relationship with your student. Um, I brought that up in, with, with my group on the snow today, it was, you know, just simply building a rapport. It's kind of where it starts, introducing yourself, you know, finding out what their past experience is, all the stuff that you guys, I know, do um, when you're out there teaching, all right? You got to find out about your student um, before, you can, uh, before you can take a step and decide what, what it is to, to do next. Based on the, the students that you have in front of you, you need to address your situation. What's the snow like today? How cold is it? Um, is it busy? Are there lots of people on the hill? Um, what's my terrain choice? You know, I've got all of those things to consider, and as experienced ski instructors, there's a lot of experience in the room, we do that naturally. We've got that, that going on in our head all the time. We're making decisions on the fly, we're doing a bit of planning, but a lot of it changes as we go as well. But we adjust quite well. A brand new instructor, Maybe not as much, so we want to help them recognize that situation is a big part of how uh, successful a student is going to be as they try to improve their skiing. So then we kind of get into the meat and potatoes side of it, which are these two here. So skiing objectives and motor skill development. And skiing objectives um, are anything from speeding up, slowing down, right, managing your, your speed changing your direction, um, things like that, those are kind of big picture team objectives. 
um, in Matt's group today and in my group certainly today, there was big picture stuff, but there was also smaller picture stuff, more refined, right? You want to try and, you know, some people were working on trying to get more grip that will take them across the hill just a little bit more. That's a skiing objective. That's a why, right? What do I, why do I want to change my skiing? Well, I want to get more grip. I want to be able to slow down on that black run. I want to be able to stay on my feet in the bumps. Those are all skiing objectives. So we look at those first. We go, well, what the, what the heck do we want to try and help this person do? Um, if you've taught a beginner le or a, a novice lesson, let's say, in your life, somebody that's skied a, 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 few less, a few times, often when you're having that conversation with them first thing in the morning, they're telling you stuff like, um, my, uh, my husband or my wife or my boyfriend or whatever took me on a black run yesterday and it scared the crap out of me, mm, right? That's somebody saying to you, I don't know how to slow down. <laughs> I don't know how to change my direction. You know, all of those kinds of things. So as a ski instructor, we're going, okay, cool. I'm going to teach them how to do some of this and stand on their feet and all this kind of stuff. But to them, their objective is probably that I need to learn how to slow down. I want to feel good and confident on the hill, right? So then we, we, we consider this last one over here. Um, which is motor skill development, and that is based on our technical reference, which is one of our core uh, concepts. Um, our technical reference is our target. It's a filter for how we look at skiing. Um, we turn with the lower body, and we, we uh, have use separation to provide a bit of opportunity to angulate and get grip. We use all of our joints to stay in balance, and we coordinate moves. And we'll get into those a little bit in a second here. Um, but uh, it's not until I know why I want to do something that I'm going to decide how. <clears throat> Does that make sense? So I'm going to, you know, somebody doesn't get grip on the black run and they go too fast. Well, I probably need to teach them how to tip their skis over and grip. That's the technical aspect. That's the motor skill, the move, right? Um, but I always come back to this one here, which is why? Why are we doing this? Um, so this decision-making um, process it's not necessarily linear, um, because every time we stop, these aspects change a little bit. Right? And so even in my learning contract with the student, my students, in fact, you may have experienced this today. Did anybody have a real high point in their day today that where they were like, oh, this feels great, I'm skiing well, this yeah. is exactly what Did anybody have that today? About 8.15. 8.15? Yeah. No, we're on the bus, man. <laughs> Um, come on, who had that today where they were like, okay, excellent, this, is, this felt good. Did anybody have uh, a point in the day today where they didn't feel like that? Yeah. Where they were yeah. 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 It might have been on, in the terrain that you ended up on. You might not have been comfortable there, and so it brings the energy down a little bit. That's all part of considering the learning contract, right? And as an instructor, every single time I stop, I look at all of these things, and I continue to go based on what's changed, what's the same, and, and all of those those points. Cool? Um, question? Yeah. Why does the situation have a yellow string? Wow. Oh my Lightning goodness. OCD. Good catch. Okay. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm uh, the oh, you're right. But you're right. Does... Is that, is that a boom? I think so. Shh. Oh. Turn, turn the camera off. Oh, I did not part out. Maybe the situation was out of some control. Maybe, it's a, maybe there's no control. No, nope. nope. I, I think that's just a graphic. They didn't get graphics the same way. Oh. <laughs> okay, moving along. No, I don't, I, I don't think there's a reason for it. There's no personal control of these situations. You can control the other three. Yeah. Yeah. We'll come back to that right. when I think I have an answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were going to eat the whole highlight of the spot. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, this one here, the gliding experience, this, these are skiing objectives, for example, for beginner skiers. Okay? Um, we try to help, again, young, new instructors understand that um, you know, mobility is, is, is something that skiers need to do. They need to be able to move around in the skiing environment. Um, you've probably taught people how to walk in their boots from the rental shop to 
the uh, to the slope. That's mobility, right? Teaching them how to skate from one place to the other to get across the flat. That's mobility. I mean, that's how we, we describe that, right? Um, gliding, that's another objective. And gliding is um, being able to let go. Because we also know that in, able to, in order to be able to change direction, at some point, you have to let go of grip, don't you? We were playing around with that today in, in, in my group, where we, we messed around with you know, the snowball that rolled across the hill and eventually went down the slope like this. We gotta do that at some point, right? So in order to get control, we have to release <laughs> control, right? So gliding is one of our, is one of our um, uh, objectives. And then speed management and direction change. And those are pretty self-explanatory. I don't think I need to go into those too, too much, but speed management being, I wanna go faster, slower. Right? Um, it, it's, it's not necessarily always slowing down. It could be that we want to teach this person to speed up. That might be a huge benefit to them. Okay? And then direction change, to be able to ski around people and go from one side of a steep black corridor to another, or keep in control in the, in the box. Right? Those, uh, those sort of things. So now some of my duplicate slides have, have, have shown up in here again. Um, and unfortunately this picture didn't, didn't come up, didn't show up very well, but uh, this is our technical reference. That's, uh, does anybody know who that is? It's a grainy picture off the internet. Yeah. I was looking for some old photos and I found one at the bottom that said, Sun Peaks, uh, 1950. She won, she won the, uh, the Her, Her, Herman, Herman now. Yeah, so anyway, we're in some peaks, I thought it was appropriate. I thought I'd, I'd throw it in there. So, what was your name? Uh, this is, um, wait, don't tell me. Yeah, Andrea Lawrence. Lawrence. Yeah. She was the answer to the trivia question on the first chair. Anybody see that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who was in my room last night? <laughs> okay. Um, so this is our, our technical reference, and again, that's one of our three um, core concepts. Use of all joints helps to maintain balance, providing the ability to manage forces, acting on the ski and the skier. It's a bit of a mouthful, all right? But simplified, it means maintain balance, right? And, and using all of our joints, our hips, our knees, our ankles, and that could mean in this respect here, it could also mean in this respect here, that kind of idea. So it's how we use our joints to stay in balance depending on what we're doing at the time. All right. Um, it also looks like this. This is Maggie Graham. This is one of our current Jeter Ski team members as well. All right. On some new equipment, obviously, a little bit newer than Andrea was skiing on. Um, but this is what that looks like. Depending on how quick you want to turn, what type, type of turn you want to be in, you're going to have to use your joints a little bit differently given your situation. All right. Oh, wow. This is the best ski picture ever. All right. I was actually debating using this slide for the joints one, but I thought it would be too much. Yeah, you gotta use all your joints. Um, yeah, this is a real guy. Martin, Martin knew this guy's name. Do you know his name? He's a Canadian guy. We're in Jobbit, everyone. <laughs> yeah, I think so too. Um, but you know, turning is led by the lower body. Okay. Turning is led by the lower body and the ski design. So we, we worked with, um, with some physics and biomechanical, biomechanics experts. Uh, to help us come up with these technical reference points as well. And we, they helped us recognize that, you know, we, we do turn with the lower body. Uh, we used to call it pivoting, it used to be one of our skills. We've kind of left that a little bit and gone more to this kind of a action-based um, description here. But it could be this, like in some situations you may want to turn like this with your lower body, but in some situations you might do a little bit of what my group did today, which is roll the foot over a little bit. Right? And, and create some, some tension in the foot that will help the ski edge. That's an effort as well, isn't it? Right? So it's, it's, a, lead, it's a lower body lead turning effort. Is that a French Canadian? I believe so. We need a French Canadian. Yep. 
<laughs> it's coming. It's coming. Neil's channeling here. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and then, of course, the ski design. We've got shape in our skis. Um, they give back <laughs> to us, and they help us turn. And there were some points today where some, a few of, of my group was saying, yeah, when I do that thing, the ski feels like it takes me through the turn. It does what I want it to do, and that's part of it. It's as much our actions as it is our, uh, our ability to let the ski do what it's designed to do at the right time. All right. Um, there's uh, Sunny Vero. She's also on our inner ski team. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, she's a great speaker. <laughs> Upper and lower body separation allows for angul angulation to provide grip. <clears throat> um, stand up for just a second. If, you, if, if you've had a couple of drinks, stay seated. But if, you, if you're good, stand up. <laughs> yeah. And just try this for me for, for a second. So lift, lift one foot off the ground and just hang out on, on one foot. Right? And then um, stand stand on that one foot for a moment, okay? Then I want you to try to roll that foot onto the inside a little bit. Toe, okay? Big toe. Roll it to the big toe side. Okay? And as you look around you, and as you try and roll a little bit, and maybe it's a feeling that you get as well, you feel like you kind of end up having to do a bit of this yeah. to make that happen. All right, everybody's kind of now moving, I see heads kind of moving down a little bit because we're starting to move like this to get on the inside foot. All right, now have a seat. Um, upper lower body separation allows for angulation, all right? And when we angulate, the skis tip up on their edges and that's, what's give, that's what gives us grip. And again, that's in any situation. I moved my mouse. There we go. That's Olivier Babu skiing uh, Delirium Dive at Sunshine Village during our training camp at uh, Interski. Again, upper lower body separation, so it's a different situation than what we saw the black and white. But still, there's separation and grip on, on the snow. And 60 years. And 60 years of change, yeah. Absolutely. All right. Finally, coordinated movement patterns direct the forces acting on the skis and the momentum of the skier from turn to turn. So we coordinate all this stuff. <laughs> There's all these actions, but if they don't happen at the right time in the right place, then they don't ha help us take our momentum from one turn to another. And that's applicable for a beginner skier in a snowplow and you guys when you're out on the hill. Right? It's applicable all the way through. Okay? That's Casey Bowyas, works at Sunshine Village. Same, same kind of thing, right? Taking the energy and the momentum from one turn to the other. So then you start building, we talked about this with my group today too, you gotta, you, you gotta go from being shaped like this in one turn to getting rid of all of that and being shaped like that in the other turn so that you get the same result going the other direction. Excellent. Um, any questions on the technical side of things? Technical reference. So again, this is our this is our target. This when we're watching skiing, we watch it based on these four concepts. Do I see the skier turning with the lower body? Right? Do I see them angulating? Do they have grip or do they ski it a lot? Right? Do I see coordinated moves so that it looks like a continuous link from one nice arc to the next arc? Right? That sort of thing. Do they stay in balance by using all of their joints? And if not, then guess what I teach towards? <laughs> right? I start to use tools and, and, and all of my best toolbox stuff to help somebody coordinate their movement patterns a little bit more. As long as it satisfies one of those concepts, then it takes us to where we want to go in terms of what we believe to be efficient and effective skiing for all skiers, all levels. All right. Awesome. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on to the slightly heavier side of the, it's not actually that heavy, but it helps us um, address this kind of, a, this thing, right? Um, I think you guys know this guy, right? right? Education is in the learning of facts with the training of the mind to think. Um, reflective learning is, uh, is 
the philosophy that, that we now teach with. And it came from David Kolb's model. That's where we, uh, if you're not familiar with, with him, that's okay, some of you are. David Kolb's model uh, of experiential education is where we started. And that's what we took to Interski in 2015. And after that, working with some education experts, some PhDs and all that kind of stuff, they said, you know what? This really works well, but make it your own. Right? You don't have to put yourself in the, the, the boxes of like conceptualization and, and all that kind of stuff, which for a lot of people is difficult to understand. Right? Um, so this is what we, we've done with it. Okay, our concept of reflective learning and how we, we uh, try to work through it. I didn't really bring this up a lot with my group today, but if you think back to some of the things that we did on snow, you might recognize some of the things that went on here um, today. Right? First of all, we got to build a task. Um, and the, the task has to, one, it has to be, well, I've actually got a slide here that, that, that will, will show us this. I'm going to go a little bit freestyle here. Um, so task building. So the, the task has to be measurable so that the learner can self-evaluate when they do it. So in my group today, do you guys remember at any point, was there a point where um, as part of something you were doing in your skiing, was there a way for you to measure whether it was happening or not? Speed, grip, turn shape, that kind of stuff. A few heads are nodding, that's good. <laughs> okay, um, there has to be some internal and external cues, right? The, 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 the skier has to be able to sense the move. So things like feel the front of your boot, okay? Or feel yourself heavy underneath your heel, right? Or feel yourself bend like this, right? So that your shoulder feels like it's moving down towards your outside foot. Things like that, depending on what it is you're doing at the moment, right? Um, there has to be an internal and external cue. Um, observable results, and this is for the teacher, right? The teacher has to be able to look at the skier doing their thing and go, that's it, and that's it, oh, that's not quite it, no, yep, yep, and they, we have to be able to know when it's happening, right? And finally, the whole goal of it is to isolate or impose a, a new move. That's what these students are here for, is to learn something <laughs> new, to be able to ski better, Right? So there's got to be some aspect that's new and different, creates a different outcome for, uh, for the skier. Right? So I'm just going to go back to my other slide here. Um, <clears throat> once we've set up a task, then the student can reflect. And when they have all of those pieces, that is what they're reflecting on. So how does it feel? How should I move? And what's going to happen to me when I do? Those are all of the answers that you need to go down and look for as you as you ski. Right? So I'm not. This is different than discovery learning, which might be an approach like, Hey Liam, I want you to go down here, and um, when it gets steeper, you might feel yourself speed up. So I want you to tell me what you feel like you have to do to keep yourself not going too fast. Right? There's some aspects of, of reflective learning in there, but it's pretty discovery-based, isn't it? Right? Where I'm going to let Liam now go off and try this, but there isn't really a this yet. I'm just saying, hey, what do you do? Except that I'm the teacher, so now Liam's learning in spite of me instead of because of me. <laughs> right? He's going out there and kind of figuring out some stuff. What we want to try to do is be very direct in our task building, so that the student will find the answers that we want them to find at that time. So that we can help them learn way faster than if we said, hey Liam, go down there and tell me what happens when. Does that make sense? So yes, yeah, so that's really what we're trying to do here. And this is kind of new for us. And to be honest, like we're in a situation where we feel like we have to give ourselves now a couple of seasons to get good at this. <laughs> right? In fact, maybe maybe a couple of seasons is a bit of a lofty goal. I'm not sure. We're in, in our we're kind of in our second season now of, of this. And so when I'm out there working with you guys, my brain's going a mile a minute it's going, okay, well what am I doing here? Am I am I you know, am I really giving this student an opportunity to find the right answers? Or am I just am I am I giving them enough, not enough? So even for me I'm I'm still practicing this stuff. But when it works, man is it cool. It really is. It's, 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 
it's awesome to see a student, it happened in the group today, where we got them to do something and they came down and suddenly they're flowing like this, wow, that felt, that's exactly what I got. I got this thing and I did it like this and it, it did that for me. That's the student getting down into this aspect here, which is understanding. The student has tried something new and they've understood cause and effect. That's, that's understanding. Is when I move like this, I get that. And that is what I wanted in my student. Right? So when we get down to understanding, the student knows what move is going to create what result. Okay? We're helping them, we're guiding them the whole way. Once they have that, then we start to vary. And again, I, I keep using my group as the example today because I was with my group. Um, but uh, we, we go over to the vary aspect of it. And what varying is, is taking one aspect, uh, terrain, speed, turn shape maybe, one of those three aspects and changing one of them at a time to help the student understand how to apply that thing in a different situation. So that they, they can learn that I don't just turn this much with my lower body all the time. Maybe in certain situations I might do it this much. And in other situations I might do it this much. Right? It's becoming skillful with an action and not just skill at it. It's, it's not just an on-off kind of light switch, it's a dimmer to it. Right? I use some of this some of the time. I use none of it some of the time because it's not applicable. For example. And by varying and being careful about how we vary, we can really help we find, we can really help a student go, wow, okay, so, uh, angulating. <laughs> if I wanna get across the hill faster, I'm gonna have to move deeper into that move. I'm gonna have to do it maybe quicker if I want the turn to happen faster. Or here, I don't wanna go fast, I wanna go a little slower, because I'm coming down into that gully where it's the beginner area and we don't wanna go fast, so I'm still angulating, but I'm just not doing it as much. Right, and then that way I'm skidding the ski a little bit more. It brings me back to skiing, to skiing objectives, right? The relationship of the ski on the snowboard, the skid, carve, short turn, big turn, fast, slow, that sort of idea, all right? Um, still with me, you're still awake? It's been a long day, I know. Cool. Um, so this this really is um, how how we teach. It's not what we teach. It's how we want to teach. Um, which is why I didn't really frame my day like for my group. It's why I didn't I, I didn't frame my day around this. I framed my day around the decision making process. Right. This happens as I work, as I use the decision-making process, if I use it properly, if I know my students, I recognize my terrain, I figure out what they want in their scheme, what objectives do they have, and then I use my technical knowledge to say, perfect, I know how to help you do that, and it, it looks like this, and it feels like that, and it gets you this. Now, we're here. <laughs> now, we're, we're doing this. All right? And when it works, it's, it's awesome. And we're learning about this um, every day. Right. Um, before I jump into this, do you guys have any questions about what you've just seen? Um, you might lay down, which is, which, is, which is perfect. Um, I just want to talk about this real quick before I go. Our high performance program and our, and our induced ski process. Um, Matt, as you guys know, is already a demonstrator for the US. He's already going to Bulgaria in 2019, which is exciting. It makes me jealous because in February, I have to start trying out again for our next team. So we're a little bit behind with the process. We don't get to it as quick. Um, but uh, we start off with a, uh, a ski selection. We go from as many people want, that want to show up that are level fours down to 24, and then it's done on a, a series of uh, ski off runs. Uh, and then next year, in January, we'll do a teaching selection, and that'll be the final selection. That's where we go down to five members in the west, five members in the east, we make a team, and then we go to Bulgaria. And I was lucky enough to go to Interski in uh, Argentina with the rest of the Green Pant team there um, in 2015, and it was, it was um, it was one of the coolest things ever, so I'm, I'm hoping to go back again. Um, what we've done with our uh, interest e and HP program, the HP program, program is the high performance camp. And we wanted to make this an inclusive process 
not an exclusive process where if you make the first cut, you get more training, <laughs> right? But the people who didn't make the first cut, which equals maybe need more training, didn't get more training, mm. right? So, so the whole concept um, was to make it inclusive and make it accessible to all of our members. And now we have hundreds, literally hundreds of people participating um, every season in our high performance camps. It's open to level one through four. Um, and the high performance team was selected at level one, two, three, and four for people who were top performers at their level at those camps. And so those high performance team members um, participate in, in certain things, you know, the national office asks them to write articles, they do videos sometimes, all that kind of stuff. We, they're a communication um, vessel in a way for us to reach to those members as well. Um, their, their peers, right, level one through, through four, right? Um, we have a four-year cycle like um, everyone else. Um, it's just a, a, var a variation on, 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 uh, on how we get through the four years. If you're not familiar with Interski, it happens every four years. The last one was in 2015, next one was in 2019. All right. Um, the, yeah, so the final selection is going to be next year for us, and we've, uh, I won't say we, because I wasn't part of designing this process, I'm part of the tryout um, to get on the team again, but the process, the process that's been designed is, is kind of unique um, for us, where um, we include a self-evaluation and a peer evaluation. And this is new this year for us, and the self-evaluation I'll make this as short as I can. We do a series of speed off runs. Um, our coaches and our evaluators will mark us. But at the end of the day, we sit in an auditorium and we watch the video of all those runs, and we mark ourselves as well. And we mark them based on some objective-driven stuff. So we do things like a corridor run. It's a nine-meter corridor on a black page. And some of the objective side of that is, do we get to the outside of the corridor all the time, some of the time, none of the time, that sort of thing. And depending on if it's none of the time, then you're at a, a level of mastery that's, however it's described, I can't remember exactly what level of mastery it is. If you're out there all the time, then you're in the top level of mastery. Okay? And without getting into the super detailed stuff, at the end of the day, what our coaches will ask us to do is mark ourselves, and then tell them why we've marked ourselves that way. 10% of the mark um, is made up by that mark. So for me, when I do this, I'm going to go ski as best I can, I'm going to watch myself ski, and I'm going to mark myself, and 10% of my final mark is made up of my discussion with the coaches. And what they're looking for is not just how you ski, but how do you understand our skiing as, as the CSIA, right? So can you look at yourself skiing and go, I'm here? <laughs> And then they're probably going to question us a little bit because if they gave me a seven on something and I come in and say, I give myself a seven, great, the marks match, but why? Right? Same thing if they gave me a three and I give myself a nine because I know I'm going to get 10% extra if I do that. Well, then they're looking at me going, you don't understand what you just saw on the video. So I think it's, it's kind of a neat, it stresses me out, I'll be honest. <laughs> going through the process, it's going to be very stressful. But, I think it's a great way to do it. And the same thing is going to happen on the teaching side. Um, next year when we do the teaching process, the 24 from the West that are selected through the skiing process will get a chance to teach our peers. And our peers are going to provide a mark which will make up a certain percentage of our final mark as well. So they're going, you know, we're going to evaluate each other also. Because in the end, we're a team. So as peers, we want to make sure that we have the strongest team going forward. We also want to look at our understanding and our all that kind of stuff. So anyway, that's a little bit, a few notes on the, on that process. Um, that's uh, that's really all of the the slides. Do you guys want to see the video again? No. Okay, probably show me again. But that's uh, that's kind of us in a, in a nutshell, and, and there are a lot of uh, other <laughs> you know there's a lot of detail to, to this that I that I haven't included because we don't need to do that here today. But um, I just have two two other things to to note is that when Matt and I have talked and, and what we learned at Interski and the whole reason why we're here is because right now 
there are similarities. There are a lot of similarities between what PSIA and the CSIA are doing, and we just are we can't help but see avenues that we potentially can go down to work together at uh, at the next interski and to work together at events like this, which you know, I'm having a blast and this is great. And any sharing opportunities, I think we can we can get are are uh, are huge. So uh, I do want to thank for myself, Neil, Walt. Uh, Matt for, for coming out, Dave for has been part of the organization, organizing of this as well. And on, uh, on behalf of Warren Jobbing, John Gillies, who are our, uh, our education managers, um, and then uh, Mark Tanjong, who is our uh, education director, uh, and then our managing director, who is uh, Francois Morrison. From all of those guys, thank you everyone for being here. And uh, yeah, have a great day tomorrow on snow. And, uh, I think we're here to mingle for a bit, and I'd love to answer any questions you have. So, yeah, thank you guys very much.